What's up, curious people? In this video, I'm going to talk about Newton's universal law of gravitation. It will be related to F net is equal ma and the weight. So most of the stuff we know already, but we'll learn a new equation, which will be Newton's universal law of gravity. Idea is to understand Newton's law of gravity, uh, calculate questions using this gravity, which is a long range force. It applies to wherever you are, it applies to you, so far away from the object as well. In this picture here, you see equation for universal law of gravity, and it applies to everywhere in the universe. Um, simply, it says two masses applies forces to each other, they both attract each other. Um, here is the equation for Newton's universal law of gravity. And the, the force between two objects, first of all, two objects with masses m1 and m2 applies a force to each other. And these forces are equal to each other. They each pull on each other. And these are actually action-reaction forces. F2 on 1 is equal to F1 on 2 and in opposite direction. And that force is directly proportional to their masses, inversely proportional to the square of distance in between their centers. Um, so this distance, distance is always between the center of the two objects. And here is our equation for it. G is a constant here. Um, M1, M2 are masses of two objects, and R squared is the distance between them. Constant G is called gravitational constant, and this is its value, 6.67 times 10 to minus 11 Newton times meter squared over kilogram squared. These are all in SI unit as we know. So the gravitational Newton's law of gravity or universal law of gravity ha, uh, has inverse square relationship as we go far away from the object. Force between the objects decreases uh, rapidly. And we all know the story of how Newton was sitting under an apple, an apple fell on his head, and he thought about uh, how everything is attracted towards the earth. And it must be the reason why the moon goes around the earth and earth goes around the sun. It should be the same force and came up with the universal law of gravity. That's simple as that, actually. And there is a question for us. The gravitational force between two giant lead sphere is 0 0.01 Newton. I'm going to draw my ugly picture here. I have two spheres. And there is a gravitational force in between them. I'm going to call it gravitational force just F and F in opposite direction. We know they are action-reaction pairs. And um, they are equal to each other in magnitude opposite in direction. So I'm going to call this F1. And this will be the same as F1. And these two giant spheres has a distance in between their centers. That's the distance that we are interested in. So I'm going to show that as R1. The distance in between. Now I know that first force here, first gravitational force is 0 0.01 Newton. And R1 is 20, newton, 20 meters, not Newton. That's the distance. What is the distance between their centers when the gravitational force between them is 0 0.16, which is why I call it F1 uh, and R1, because there is a second situation we're talking about. First of all, force gets larger. So I can guess that since force gets larger, we have a smaller distance. We have the same object, so masses are the same and we have larger force. They will still be attractive forces, still be equal to each other, so F2 and F2. And there's still a distance in between their center, it decreased, which is why I have a larger force, although I have the same masses. And I'm going to call that R2, and I don't know that. 
that's what the question is asking me. What is that force R2? Um, <clears throat> here I can go by logic, first of all. And F2 is given. F2 is given us. Let's put that here. 0.16. Since masses are the same, I'm going to call them M1, M2. Um, and general equation for a gravitational force in between two masses is equal, is equal to G M1, M2 over R squared. R is the distance in between them. Since G is a constant, M1, M2 are not changing, I can only look at the relation between this gravitational force and distance, which is inversely proportional, and gravitational force is inversely proportional to not to r, to r squared. So if I can write down f1 over f2, and see how much larger f2 is from f1, 0 0.01 newton over 16, 0 0.16 newton. I'm going to find 1 over 16. So F2 is 16 times larger than F1. So I can write this F2 is equal to 16 times F1. Once I find this, and I know F is inversely proportional to R squared, if F2 gets 15 times larger, that should give me R2 is 4 times smaller than R1. So R2 is R1 over 4. That's going by logic, okay? So since I already know R1, 20 meters given, I can find R2 using that. 5 meters will be my answer. That's going by logic. And I know a lot of you might have a problem with this. And I can go by math too. In these type of questions, I might be startled by thinking that, oh, I don't know the masses. How will I solve? I can just look at the ratio and see what cancels. And we're going to do that here, the second approach, okay? It's more mathematical. And I'm going to come up with the same result. I'm going to find the ratio of F1 over F2. I know these guys as numbers, so I'm going to get a number here, which is 1 over 16. I know there already. And I'm going to write down the equations for each. G, M1, M2 over R1 squared, right? That's F1. And G, M1, M2 over R2 squared. Only R's changed, so we have the same masses, same G's. When I am dividing, the same things cancels, right? So I can cancel these guys and what I'm gonna have left on the right hand side will be here 1 over r1 squared 1 over r2 squared I inverse them I'm gonna have this r2 squared over r1 squared so f1 over f2 is equal to r2 squared over r1 squared let's summarize this maybe in here f1 over f2 is equal to r2 squared over r1 squared. I could also guess this easily because inverse proportionality, if I do r of 1 over f2, f is inversely proportional to r squared. That should be equal to r2 squared over r1. Now I want to solve for r2. I'm going to multiply each side by r1 squared, regular algebra. r1 squared will cancel here, and I'm going to find... From here, r2 squared is equal to r1 squared times f1 over f2. I'm looking for r2, not r2 squared, so I'm going to take square root of both sides. All right. r2 will be equal to square root of r1 squared times f1 over f2. Here I can take r1 squared out as r1. We know square inside the square root comes out as so, and we can write this to be that. And that will give us the same answer. Square root of f1 over f2 will be square root of 1 over 16. We'll take it out as, as 4, 1 over 4, right? So we're going to have this. r2 is equal to 20 meters times square root of 1 over 16 
that will be 20 over 4, 5 meters, the same result. So go either by logic, by math, both will give you, of course, should give you the same solution. I'm going to show this to you here. All right, this is a question. Um, some logical questions can appear. Uh, do uh, quite a bit of ex oh, not experience problem solving on that to settle with the idea that force gravitational force is equal to um g m1 m2 over r squared so directly proportional to the masses inversely proportional to r squared this question here is a quick check we have two planets two and a m and m the magnitude uh, of force planet Y exerted on X is blank times the magnitude of the force planet X exerted on M. Uh, idea to settle down here is that forces are equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, so they are the same. So Fx on Y is equal to Fy on X. Equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. I would just go ahead and call them F and F or F gravity, F gravity. Give them the same um, name because they have same magnitude. Notice opposite in direction and they are action reaction pair. Action equals reaction. Remember Newton's third law. So one acts on the other, pulls it, the other acts back on the one, and we have equal and opposite forces here. Here's the answer. In this question, it's easy to go logical gravitational force is 1 million Newton first. What will the force be if the distance between the asteroid is doubled? If I go here, write down my equation F G M 1 M 2 over R squared. Inverse proportionality, if R is doubled, F will be divided by 4, will be 1 fourth. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to call this F2 and it will be F1 over 4, 1 million. Newton over 4, that will be 25, 250, sorry, 1,000. Newton, again, R becomes 2 times larger, force becomes 4 times less, smaller, because of inverse proportionality with F and R squared. Um, that's the whole idea, actually, and we're going to now tie it to weight and uniform circular motion for orbits. Uh, it's all related to gravitational force, okay? We already talked about weight, right? And we said that's equals to mg. And guess what? This weight is because of the gravitational force the Earth applies to us. So it's also equal to F gravity in between us and the Earth. Here we have an apple. Let's call the mass of the apple m, or maybe m1. And mass of the Earth, well, I call it M in the solution I have here, so I'm going to call it M. And this is what is generally done. And the mass of the Earth, capital M, uh, again, they're generally in books and internet if you search for this idea. The object's mass is taken as small m, and the planet's mass is taken as large m, or the large um, body's mass, like you see in this figure here. So weight is equal to gravitational force if we are standing on the surface of the Earth, okay? And the distance in between, in this case, is this, right? From the center of the apple to the center of the Earth, it's approximately our Earth. Notice here how the size of the apple is exaggerated to be to show it, but it's a very small size compared to the Earth. So distance between is about our Earth, the radius of the Earth, okay? Using this idea here, we can write down that gravity is equal to weight, then Gm, K, 
Capital M over R squared is equal to mg. Notice here, m's cancel from both sides. And we can solve for the gravitational acceleration to be this. Now, if I am on the surface of the Earth, R is equal to Re. I have a gravitational acceleration. But if I am farther away, like in this picture here, I have a large R. Then my G will decrease. The farther away I am, the more decrease I will have. Now, if I'm really close to the Earth's surface and difference is not much, I won't maybe feel too much changes. But if I'm at least one R Earth away or more, I will have a quite difference in the gravitational acceleration. So actually, we have an equation for gravitational acceleration. Anywhere on the surface of the Earth or around the Earth, close orbit around the Earth, we assume G is constant, but farther away it changes. That's one important information here. Another important information is on the surface of the Earth, weight is equal to mg, or very close to the surface. For example, it doesn't matter if I'm exactly on the surface sea level or if I'm on top of a mountain. It will not make a big difference. So we ignore the change and we assume g is the same here, top of the mountain and on the surface. But again, if I go really far away, it matters. Thus, for orbiting objects around the Earth that are far away, g will be different. But I still will apply the same equation. I'll still have f gravity defined the same. That will be the force pulling the object towards Earth. And the objects will be making a uniform circular motion. Remember uniform circular motion? So what do I say then? I can apply f net is equal to ma. Newton's second law. Tells me that, right? And I already know A is always V squared over R for uniform circular motion. I'm going to say then F gravity is equal to MV squared over R. This is MA here. This is Newton's second law applied to uniform circular motion combined with the idea that gravitational force is the net force here. It's the force generating the centripetal pull so we have a uniform circular motion everywhere around the orbit this guy this object whatever it is right international space station moon whatever it is will experience that force it will do a uniform circular motion and it will always be towards the center so if i want i can call it, call it centripetal force but physically it's the gravitational force generating that centripetal force there is also an acceleration towards the center. In this case, it's g, but we learned that g actually changes as I go far away from the Earth. So this is our description of it. Putting everything in here, we can solve for what should be the velocity of an orbit in satellite. Here, we're going to cancel m's. Nothing else. Well, this one of these r's will cancel and solve for a v. Since it is orbiting, it's still uniform circular motion. Guess what? It will have a period. Remember period? Capital T we're going to be using for period in this context. And it's the time for one full rotation. And for one full rotation, the distance traveled will be 2 pi r. So I can apply the same as I did with the uniform circular motion. I'm going to say I get this v. And I know it's equal to distance traveled over time. We have constant speed. Remember that the magnitude of velocity is constant, so I can apply constant speed equation. And I'll find this. Distance is 2 pi r over time is period for one full rotation, and I can solve for period. Over here, personally, I like to stop here. So I get velocity from here, input, and solve for period. And I'm really, really good that, with that because I'm happy with that because it's more physics. But in books and everywhere, this equation is also given. And I know some of you folks just like using equations. So I can go ahead and derive an equation for a period for an object. R distance away from Earth, M here would be the mass of the Earth. R is the distance again and T is the period. 
and I can solve it from here too. I'll be using this approach always, but if you guys feel more happy with this equation, go, go ahead and use it. Again, it's given in the book and everywhere else you check for period, you'll see a version of this. So I'm going to give it to you. Here, I listed for you what is the mass of the Earth. Um, G gravitational um, constant or universal gravitational constant and the radius of the earth. Knowing those, uh, we can get G on the surface or if we are a little far away, how it changes. We can do experiments on that. Um, again, as I mentioned in the previous um, page, for a satellite very close to orbit around the Earth, <clears throat> ISS is actually one of them. It's not really, really too far away from Earth. International Space Station. That's what ISS stands for. People tell the abbreviations and I don't understand them. Sometimes I get mad. So don't get mad at me. International Space Station. Close to Earth. Actually close Earth orbit. We can assume G is constant. We'll get slight differences in solutions though. Uh, so if we take exact distance, remember distance should be from the center of the Earth. We don't see the center here. I'm not going to show it, but it's always from the center of the Earth. So it will be our Earth, right, plus this height. I'm going to call this height from the surface. Applied, you can find how much gravitational acceleration ISIS has and calculate its period. Or you can go ahead and use the sky to calculate its period. This will be the mass of Earth again. And this will be the radius of Earth. And if you do that, you're going to find a value of 93 minutes. So each 93 minutes, um, a little over an hour, one hour and a half, right? 90 minutes is one hour and a half. Uh, ISS takes one full rotation, and so they see many sunset and sunrise in one day. Um, <clears throat> if we send something in an orbit, low Earth orbit, again, we can assume G is constant, and it's actually what we're doing is we're throwing the object, that's what the uh, satellites do, uh, with a very large speed, so it takes a projectile around the Earth and always misses the Earth. There is this really nice, cute experiment online where you throw something, it does a projectile with a velocity. As you increase the velocity, we know logically that the projectile will have a larger range and increase it larger and larger range. And at some point, with some velocity, it will miss the Earth and it will start orbiting the Earth at low Earth orbit. That's actually a projectile that is in constant fall and never hits the Earth. Because of this constant fall, we actually, the, uh, the um, astronauts feel weightless, or if we are there, we would feel weightless. And still there is G, still there is force pulling us towards the Earth. We are falling towards each other, Earth and us, in, in orbit. And we are always missing each other. That's what is happening. We are in a constant free fall. And that's why we feel weightless. All right. Some nice, cute questions might come out of this or period comparison. This one is asking us, how do you compare these two different masses around the Earth? Same distance away, again, to get to the get used to the idea of distances always should be from the center to center. Um, same distance away, how would you compare their speed? Looking at my speed equation, this is mass of Earth. Same for both. And this is a distance, the same for both, so velocities will be the same. The mass of the orbit and satellite doesn't matter for the speed. Here's another one. We have same masses of the satellites now. They are different distances away. I'm going to call this R1. This should be from the center. And R2. Uh, which one has a larger speed or higher speed? The one that is closer or smaller orbit would have a larger speed. Here 
is a kind of a plug and check question. I want you folks to be careful though. We will have large numbers here, 10 to the powers and so on. So as you put the numbers in the calculators, make sure you put appropriate parentheses. And other than that, most of the questions will be plug and check. This one, for example, is telling us that uh, we have communication satellites, right, GPS and so on. They are usually in what we call geostationary orbit. A satellite appears to remain stationary as the Earth rotates. It's said to be in geostationary orbit. And what does that mean is that we know Earth rotates around itself, right? Let's say we have the sun here. That's why we have day and, day and night. And I'll see my here. I'm rotated. And one day later, I'll come back here. If there is a satellite at, at geostationary orbit, and it appears to be stationary to us, that means it's rotating with us at the same rate. What does that mean? The daily period of Earth, which is 24 hours, Earth's rotation, is equal to the, the period of the orbit and satellite, okay? So when I say geostationary orbit, that means that object, that satellite has a 24-hour period. That's the information here. What is the radius of the orbit for, a, for such a satellite? That's what we're going to find. We know the period, and we're looking for the radius. We can go ahead and use a plug and chug approach here. We have this equation here, and we have to convert period to seconds first. So 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. It will be this much time. And then what I would do is to go ahead and um, solve for R. Here, maybe algebra could be a bit tricky. First of all, I have to take square of each side because r cube is in the square root. And I'm going to have this over here. And uh, to solve for r cube, I'm going to leave it alone first. I'm going to take this guy to here as multiplication. This guy comes as division, my version. I'm going to have this dude. But I have r cube is equal to that. So I have to take to the power 1 over 3 of each side. Let me write it here. So, and I do this changes. Your version is multiply each side by gm divide by 4 pi squared. I'll have r cube is equal to t squared times gm over 4 pi squared. I'm looking for r. To leave r alone, I have to take 1 over 3rd power on the left and 1 over 3rd power on the right. And trees cancel here, and I'm left with this equation. This will be the version you like. I put it here. Then you put in numbers, and you should get this value for R. But what I would like more to use, actually, is find the speed using the idea that F gravity is equal to mv squared over R. I like rederiving using the physical knowledge. So I will say GMM over R squared is equal to MV squared over R. And solve for V here. I'm going to get that same equation as we derived already. Uh, R, v is equal to GM over R. You guys can start here. Get a value of V. And then you say this V is equal to 2 pi r over t, right? You know t, you know v, solve for r. It actually becomes easier algebraically. You don't have to go through this r cube and stuff and so on. But you should get the same answer. Uh, let me also show you that. And I want you folks to please go ahead and solve the same question with this find v, input it in here, and find r. From here, r should be equals to equal to v times t over 2 pi. And that's your duty to do. The last, well, last two bits of things I want to tell you folks is um, this goes for everywhere. Moon also has an attraction for anything on it. 
The sun has, of course, it's attracting all the planets and so on. Only difference will be they will have different G. So if I'm on, on moon, I'm going to have a gravitational force applied to me, which will be my weight, right? And it will be equal to M times G moon. Uh, this is, of course, gravitational force as well. I can write it as G M M moon over R squared. R will be now our moon. If I'm on a different planet, that will be our planet and so on. So the bottom line is the same thing will apply. My weight is equal to mg and gravitational force, and I can solve for g as I did on Earth. This was for Earth, but in this case, m will be the, the mass of moon, right? And r will be the radius of moon. Again, if I'm on a different planet, it will be the mass of that planet and radius of that planet. So each celestial object will have a different gravitational acceleration. It will attract the same object differently. If I am me, my mass m never changes here on moon, on planets, on sun, but my weight will change because it's the gravitational force and it will be dependent on the gravitation acceleration on where I am. For example, a 120 kilogram astronaut would weigh more than 1200 Newton on Earth, but only 200 Newton on the moon. Moon's gravitational acceleration about one sixth of the Earth. And this question here is nicely comparing those. So if we have three different planets here uh, and the mass of an a person is 60 kilogram that doesn't change and that person is sent to all these different planets okay let me draw this here because on the surface we don't have to be on the top right we're still attracted by gravitational force and that's equal to mg i'm going to call this mg3 that's weight mg1 and M no, not one, MG2, MG1. This is also GM, M over R squared. I can go with that to see. In this case, it will be 2M, and in this case, it will be 3M, right? Or I can go simple with G, calculating G for each using this equation here. Whichever has larger gravitational acceleration will give me a larger weight. So G1 in this context will be G, capital G, which is gravitational constant, mass of the planet A, M, divided by radius of the planet A, R squared, because I am on the surface. G2, capital G, 2M, over 2R squared here, a very common error you guys have. It should be the square of all this thing. So square of that thing is not 2r squared. It's 2 times r all squared, so it will be 4r squared. I hope you know what I mean here. Dividing by 2, I'm going to have here g m over 2 times r squared. Um, and for this guy, g3 will be capital G, 3m over 9 r squared when I take square of this whole thing, okay? Dividing by 3 each, I'll have g m over 3 r squared. Look at the first one. If I call this g, the second one is half of that. See 1 over 2 here. And third one is 1 third of that. So here's what I have. g1 is larger than g2, not q2. The larger one will have the largest weight. But I could also compare their weights, right? So I'm going to have the largest weight in planet, first planet, planet A, as I call it, G1. Here's another question, and this will help us understand that the gravitational forces applied everywhere, universally, on any other planets. Uh, Mars has a moon called Phobos, and it's orbiting at 9,400 kilometers from the center of Mars. 
okay uh, let me draw that picture here so I have Mars and I have an orbit and satellite around it I'm remembering uniform circular motion can help me find speed and I know the force applied is gravitational force I'm going to call the mass of the satellite small m, mass of Mars, capital M, distance between R. This dude will have a velocity. I don't know if I'm asked to find that, but I'm going to show it. And it will do uniform circular motion. The force is the gravitational force. And that's what is providing a centripetal force here. Okay, so I did my remember and I draw my picture. Now I continue reading the question. Um, Mars has a mass of 6.4 times 10 to 3 kilograms, so let's put that here. That's a given. 10 to 3, kilogram. And um, the distance is R orbiting at 9,400 kilometers means distance is 9,400 kilometers. I'm going to write this in terms of uh, scientific notation. Remember, we move back. I'm moving three steps, so this will be 9.4 times 10 to 3 kilometers. One kilometer is equal to 10 to 3 meters. So as I convert to meter, remember, right away I convert to meters. Simply, I multiply this by 10 to 3, or 1,000 kilometers goes away these trees add so I'm gonna have my distance or distance of Phobos from Mars as 9.4 times 10 to 6 meters and that's what I want meters second kilograms Newtons SI units all right what is Phobos orbital period And how does it compare to the length of Martian day, which is about 24 hour? One Martian day. Twenty-five hours, sorry. Here my approach would be this. I find V again because Fg is equal to and we squared over R and also G M M over R squared. Um that's what is provided in the centripetal acceleration. I also know Fg is equal to general description G M M over R squared from here. Or I can just go ahead and say, okay, velocity is equal to G M over R. Was it correct? Square root of that. See, I don't remember the equation. I don't remember logics. I get my V from here. And then I say for one full period, the time it takes is 2 pi r, v is the speed is a v. I can solve for period as 2 pi r over v. Because v will be 2 pi r over t. And I can always switch these two guys. It will give me correct algebra. So solve for this guy, input here, solve for this guy, you should get 7 hours, 7.69 hours, that's about 7.69 hours, please find that. That's about, um, 3 times 7 is 21, that's about 3 times, a little bit over 3 times in one day, so the Phobos goes around Mars, a little bit more than three times in a day because Mars has 24 hours a day. And that's about seven hours, 45-ish minutes. Um, so we can actually think eight hours. Three times eight is 24, so about three times. Still the same thing. All right, make sure please folks go ahead and solve all these um, mass is given. I'm going to put the value of G here. You're going to need that as well. 6.67 times 10 to minus 11 Newton times meter squared over kilogram squared. And get that number. This will be a really nice practice for you. 
The very, very last thing before I talk about some applications for this uh, lecture is weightlessness. And it's not really a new matter here. We talked about weightlessness, how if we are in a free fall in an elevator, right, our apparent weight would change. And we say if we are falling with an acceleration, down with an acceleration equals G, and applying it in the second law, remember a direction is always positive. This guy's in it. And here is our apparent weight. Let's let's do a review here. And when I apply in the second law here, F net is equal to MA. Remember I'm applying it to this guy. I'm gonna say F net here is MG minus N. That's equal to MA. I'm solving for n, I can switch these two guys, this goes as plus, this comes as minus, that's my way here. Solving for n will give me mg minus ma. Now it's mg minus ma, I'm going to find, I'm going to be less weight dependent on this equation, but if my a is equal to g, my weight will be zero. That's weightlessness. Uh, I don't feel any weight because I'm not pushing on the scale and scale is not pushing back on me. So I don't feel any weight. The earth is still pulling me and uh, I still have mg but I don't feel any weight because of this fall. Free fall is the same. Every fully free fallen object has a because g down I would feel weightless. Now for satellites around orbit, we already discussed that it's a, it's a kind of free falling all the time. An acceleration can be approximated to G in low Earth orbit. So we will say these guys are in free fall as well. If they weight themselves, the derived equation will be exactly the same as the elevator. You know, they'll write down MG. You know, see in here, G is not changing. Uh, N, N will be equal to zero if A is equal to G. So they, the orbit and space stations are also in free fall. That's why astronauts feel weightless in space. This is a cool thing. They go around and have fun, but it's also a problem uh, because astronauts spend a lot of time in the environment, the space environment, weightlessness. They'll lose their bone and muscles. And one solution to that is to rotate our space station to give them an apparent weight, uh, apparent normal force due to uniform circular motion. And that was uh, shown in uh, movie Space Odyssey 2011. Uh, here's a simple question on that. This is a simple matter of uniform circular motion. Okay, if I feel a normal force, that's my apparent weight, and if I feel a normal force, I'm going to feel a weight, and I'm, I'm not going to be weightless, weightless anymore. So if n is larger than zero, I have an apparent weight, okay? And I can maintain this by rotating my spacecraft. And a rotating spacecraft will have a speed and speed will be changing direction and will have a center pedal acceleration which causes a due to a center seeking force so and that center seeking force or center pedal force if we want to call it will be the normal force Let's read the question here. I did the thinking already before reading the question. At what speed must the interior surface of the space station with R1700 meters? So we gave a radius of 1700 meters to this space station. Let me show it here. That would be from the axle to the edge. And that is given. Let's put it in here. There's no place on the picture now. Um, what should be the speed? So that the astronaut located at the point P experiences a push, a push which would be the normal force, right, on his feet that is equal to his weight on Earth. What does that mean? 
equals to his weight on earth. So what should be velocity? So N, normal force is equal to mg. That's all. Now over here we apply Newton's second law. Right? That's what we do for uniform circular motion. F net is equal to ma. And then we find that F net. In this case it's only N. It's equal to M. V squared over R. Remember, A is always equal to V squared over R. I keep repeating this to help you folks be comfortable with this idea. You can directly jump here. My F net is M MV squared over R for a uniform circular motion. Then you go ahead and calculate what is maintaining that F net. It's only N in this case. I already am given that I want N to be mg. I want to feel as if I'm on Earth and have that weight, feel that weight. And then I can use that to solve for V. And that's it. I'm going to get from here V squared is equal to GR. Take square root of each side V is equal to square root of GR. And once I input in all the values, g is 9.8 meters per second squared and my r is given in meters 1700 meters let me extend this guy here i will find a speed of 129.07 meters per second all right it's almost done. It's almost done, everybody. Uh, so this question is a quick check. I'll quickly pass it. Why do the astronauts feel weightless in space? Because they are in a constant free fall and they don't feel their weight. Um, on grand scale, I'm going to show you a little bit of um, videos and so on here. So the rest will be a little bit more fun. Um, so, as I have mentioned before, um, gravity is universal, all right? Uh, it applies to everything in the universe. Every mass, any mass, any two masses apply forces to each other. And it turns out galaxies has all those stars in them and they rotate around the galaxy center and so on. It's all due to gravity. Okay, and it turns out even light is attracted by gravity, and um, this was explained by Einstein. Now, Newton figured that there is a force in between bodies, and he didn't know how that force applies at a, a faraway distance. He described it, it worked pretty much, um, but he couldn't explain how it applies at a faraway distance. An explanation came with Einstein. Einstein described that any object with a mass in space makes a dent in space fabric. And that's why they apply gravitational force. Any object coming by that dent will be attracted towards that object. And he defined gravity, um, gravitational equation, using that idea. And when we, to a good approximation, when we apply it to bodies and solar system and so on, mostly, or two bodies attracting each other, mostly the, it comes down to Newton's equation and it worked for most of the cases. But for some cases, it did not work. For example, why the light is also attracted by gravity, although it doesn't have mass, cannot be explained by Newton's approach, can be explained by Einstein's approach. Um, Mercury's um, precession cannot be explained by Newton's approach, can be explained by Einstein's approach. So a real general de description of gravity is it's a field and it's applied by uh, masses that makes a dent in the space fabric. You see the simulation here that this is the Einsteinian approach. A Newtonian approach says it's equal to gm, m over r squared. Um, even today, though, when computing trajectories for space probes to moon to Mars, we use Newtonian theory, and it works pretty well. So only in some rare cases we need to use Einstein's theory. 
And it's the exact, perfectly correct theory for gravity, though. So the better way of thinking of gravitational force is that is a field. It's not like a straight line applies to us. It's everywhere around the Earth. And wherever you go, you will have the effect of it. And this is a better way of showing how that works in space. So the force, may force be with you, and the force field in Star Wars is, is, is correct, actually. And I'm not sure if we can harness that force and use it in the future, uh, like Dr. Strange does, but we might. And there's actually a, a scientific theory which scientists are working on, and Boeing, new patent, uh, took this approach, and scientists are working on it, is that um, can we provide a force field around um, planes or any places so any, attra any attack from outside can be stopped by that force field and we can be safe, nicely safe inside that force field. Maybe it will work in the future. We don't know. Um, <clears throat> black holes, we all know famous black holes are have very large gravity because they happens when the stars dies and the stars mass should be around at least two to three solar mass, two to three times larger than the sun. They become smaller and smaller and smaller, so our hue gets really, really small. At some point becomes zero or very close to zero. So gravitational attraction they have becomes very large or infinite. So they attract things very strongly, infinitely. Einsteinian approach, they make a dent in space and anything falls into that. You can see a scene here from uh, Interstellar. The astronauts are going into a black hole. It's a must see. As you go in, there's a strong force applied to you, of course. You guys heard about the spa spaghettification and so on. Um, it is all shown in this. You don't really see it, but you see that the astronauts are suffering because of too much gravity. Time slow down and so on. Anyways, go ahead and watch it. Um, another theory is wormholes. We detected black holes, but we didn't detect wormholes. The difference between wormholes and black holes is that wormholes, instead of opening a hole in the, in the space, they open to another region in the universe. And movie contact nicely shows that in the scene. Uh, the astronaut travels through a wormhole, something similar to this picture here. Notice again, some gravity, and how people are affected by that. Alright. Alright, I'll leave you with that. Go ahead and watch these. They are really, really interesting movies. See you in class.